and welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview segment, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode, and we've also got our Tomorrow producers. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, this is gonna be an exciting one. We were talking before the show about how we're having Generation Orbit on, and um, not a whole lot of people, even in the Tomorrow Studios, really know who Generation Orbit is. So we've got AJ Piplica, the COO, the Chief Operating Officer of Generation Orbit. AJ, welcome to tomorrow. Hey Ben, thanks for having me on. So um, who is Generation Orbit? What are you guys doing? So we're building small air launch systems for small payloads. Um, right now, we're working primarily on a vehicle called Go Launcher One. Um, it's a single-stage liquid rocket that's launched from a Gulfstream Three aircraft, um, and it's primarily designed for hypersonic flight testing. Um, we're also operating a small uh, Learjet um, with uh, a pod underneath the wing uh, that we call the Go Flight Experiment Test Bed, and we utilize this for some uh, testing of uh, air launch subsystems as well as a platform for STEM education. So every flight that we have um, of the, uh, the Go FET, uh, we like to have a, a student group uh, basically put together a small CubeSat that they fly uh, and, and operate as though it were in flight. So you guys have been around for a little while now. Uh, how did you guys get started doing some of these small sats and small launchers? Sure. So, uh, yeah, Go has been around for about five years. Um, we're a subsidiary of SpaceWorks Enterprises. Um, you may be familiar with SpaceWorks um, as the company that uh, puts together a small sat market forecast every year. Um, so, as you can imagine, we had a, our eye on the small sat launch market for quite some time, even before we started the company. Um, but we saw a real opportunity to put together um, the kind of two skill sets one being uh, knowledge of the small sat launch market, and then the other being uh, experience in a number of air launch systems uh, over the past maybe 15 years or so. Um, so we saw a real niche where we thought air launch um, could be a really good uh, good application uh, for overall small sat launch vehicles. Yeah, I think that the key thing here is you're doing this today, right? So the Go Flight Experiments, uh, the GoFET, is is launching right now today. So if I wanted to send something up on that today, I could. Yeah, absolutely. So we've flown it uh, three times. Uh, most recent flight was in December of last year, um, and uh, yeah, we do that for commercial customers as well as uh, some of our own uh, internal R&D efforts, and then um, again with uh, bringing in students uh, as much as we can as well. And then moving forward, you've got additional plans ab above and beyond the Go Flight Experiments test bed. You've also got, like you mentioned, Go Launcher One. What what does mm -hmm. Go Launcher One look like? How is it different than what you've got today? Sure. So Go One, uh, it will be the first uh, actual vehicle that we've designed and built in house uh, that we're flying. Uh, the Go Fet is a is an old uh, electronic countermeasures pod that we've basically gutted the internals of. Uh, but Go One will be our first rocket system, um, and we'll be using it to fly uh, in the atmosphere at uh, Mach numbers up to about six or eight. So um, we're flying a rocket the way you would normally fly a scramjet. Um, and the reason for that is because we don't have very many operating scramjet vehicles to uh, fly in these kinds of flight conditions. So, you know, this is, I kind of liken it back to what X-15 did uh, back in the 50s, um, using a, a rocket vehicle as a test bed for uh, hypersonics technology. So primarily focused on, um, yeah, flying high Mach number, high dynamic pressure uh, flight conditions. And both of these are air launch systems, and in the chat room, uh, someone basically asked, what's the advantage of doing an air launch as opposed to a ground launch? Sure, so you get a couple of things. Um, one, obviously flexible basing. So uh, you can take your, if it's designed correctly, you can take your entire launch uh, infrastructure um, out to any licensed spaceport around the globe. Um, and that's helpful uh, whether you're flying a suborbital mission or even orbital, um, getting into different launch azimuths and so forth. Um, obviously, there's a performance advantage um, in launching above much of the appreciable atmosphere. Um, so you can put a larger expansion ratio uh, on your booster engine, so you get a little high performance ISP and thrust uh, from that vehicle or from that system. Um, and uh, I think at a small scale, um, when we're talking about rockets that weigh you know less than 10,000 pounds or so, um, there's there's a wide range of aircraft that uh, that can carry those kinds of weights. So. Um, you know, we have uh, a number of Gulfstream 3s that uh, are available to us uh, to go fly the kinds of missions that we need to do today. And you kind of just, you, you glossed over it pretty quickly, but, you know, <laughs> one of the advantages is, of course, um, you're higher up in the atmosphere, and so 
Uh, you're, you're essentially a two-stage launch system. Uh, you t look at a traditional rocket, it's stages, and the engine on the second stage is actually designed slightly differently than the sea level engines to uh, mm -hmm. uh, compensate for the lack of um, uh, pressure and atmosphere. Uh, but you don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to have an entire rocket engine on the first stage. You're using the airplane to get to that point. Yep, exactly. So, um, yeah, you can certainly consider uh, the aircraft as the first stage or stage zero uh, of the system. So, you know, turbine-based. Um, we take the aircraft up to uh, 35 to 40,000 feet, uh, and then we do a launch maneuver where uh, we bring the flight path angle on the system up to about 35 or 40 degrees um, and then release the rocket. So it's actually at uh, about 40 degrees uh, of flight path angle when, uh, when the vehicle is released. And that's actually a big driver, especially when um, you're looking at delta V's to orbit uh, that initial flight path angle because uh, ideally it wants to be somewhere up around 55 or 60 degrees. Um, but as much as you can get uh, really helps you. You don't have to turn as much with the rocket. So Pegasus, for example, uh, launched pretty close to zero. So you'll see a, a pretty pretty steep pull up that the vehicle has to do. So using the aircraft for as much as we can. We have big wings. We use them. Uh, so talking about delta V for a moment or the change in velocity, um, uh, Neuropilot asks, what's the delta V benefit of a larger Gulfstream subsonic versus a supersonic MiG-21? Oh, well, uh, I don't know if I have the numbers off the top of my head. Um, but uh, you, you do end up launching at a higher dynamic pressure, generally, um, as you go supersonic. Uh, so the drag losses uh, can be increased, uh, even though you're starting at a higher velocity. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if I have a number off the top of my head, but, um, yeah, it should be a minimal benefit. Uh, a couple more questions from the chat room. Uh, Lance asks, what kind of cargo mass can you do, and to what orbits? Okay, so uh, Go Launcher 1 is, is just a single-stage suborbital vehicle, so it doesn't actually go to orbit, but it's designed for payloads of 300 to 1,000 pounds. Um, the future orbital systems that we're looking at, uh, there's a number of them. Uh, Go 2 has been uh, in our roadmap for quite some time, and that was sized for uh, about 45 kilograms or 100 pounds to low Earth orbit. And then what kind of orbital planes can you do? Is it just pure low Earth orbit? Could you do any sort of polar launches? Uh, what can you yeah, do Yeah, so that's... Yeah, one of the flexibilities of, uh, of air launch is that uh, you can hit almost any azimuth, um, both from the East Coast or the West Coast. Hawaii is actually a very interesting place to launch from because um, you can go pretty much any direction pretty close to the equator. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, we don't have to go build up launch sites uh, in different parts of the globe to get to different inclinations, which is helpful. And you, you mentioned I think you had six flights already. Those weren't just test flights. You've actually, your Space Vogel is asking, have you actually launched payload thus far? Oh, uh, no, no, nothing yet. So the first uh, rocket-powered flights uh, of the GO-1 will be uh, about toward the end of next year, early 2018. So we've got still a good deal of uh, development to do. Um, we are in the process of a couple uh, ground demonstration programs right now. Um, so about around this time next year, we will have completed uh, a ground demonstration of the fully integrated stage. Um, we will have also completed... Uh, captive carry and release flight testing of uh, a mock-up test article, so it matches the mass properties and, and aerodynamic properties. Um, and then we'll put those two together um, and fly the real vehicle toward the end of next year. Now that's go one, but the uh, flight mm -hmm. experiments test bed, that has flown customers or oh. has that only been... It has. Yep, yep, yeah. So we've had three of those. Uh, we just don't, it's, it's just a fully captive uh, test bed. It doesn't launch anything from the aircraft. And, and where do you go from here? Is, is, are you eventually going to do a suborbital and orbital air launch systems, or is that, what's your kind of path forward from after go one? Yeah, so there's a couple of different paths that we can take. Obviously, we're keeping a close eye on the small sat market. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how that develops, both on the supply and demand side in the coming years. Um, I think we're going to be in a good spot to uh, join the fight there. Uh, once Go-1 is complete, we have a number of designs uh, ready to go for larger air launch systems um, that you'll see uh, on our website. Um, but then, you know, with, with Go-1 being a hypersonic platform, um, we're also going to be in a unique position to push the boundaries of atmospheric flight. Um, so we're very interested in uh, looking at high-speed point-to-point transportation of cargo uh, and people. Um, once, uh, once we uh, kind of develop the technology that we need to get there. So... Um, I think, you know, come, come around 2018, uh, I think you'll see uh, both uh, orbital and uh, high-speed point-to-point uh, vehicles in our future. Is this, is this an example? I think this is the go-next vehicle. Is that even mm -hmm. further in the future? No, that's, that's what a, uh, one option for uh, what a high-speed point-to-point vehicle would look like. Um, this one uh, uses a combined cycle 
uh, propulsion system. So it uses uh, turbines uh, as well as uh, scramjet propulsion uh, to basically cruise uh, Mach 6 or so um, to uh, fly in the atmosphere. Um, altitudes range, you know, from uh, 90, 90 to 100,000 feet or so. Uh, Trebles asks, why not use like a quadcopter or air balloon? Just go up as really high as you can and then release the rocket. Sure. So uh, what you don't get with um, with a balloon launch uh, is uh, velocity or flight path angle. So you get a good deal of altitude. Um, you also can't uh, control the um, the launch point as well uh, as you can with an aircraft. You can you can pretty much hit uh, a small box or window that you need to be in without uh, being able to kind of just uh, you know get rid of disturbances from wind and turbulence and so forth. That you it's a little bit more difficult to do with a balloon. Uh, quadcopters, I think you're pretty limited in terms of the altitude that you can hit with those. Uh, Dada, if we go back to the image of the Go Launcher 1, uh, you, you can actually see it sitting underneath the, the wing. Uh, there's only one underneath the wing, and um, uh, someone asked in the chat room, I apologize, I forgot, I've missed their name. Space Mike has asked, would you ever launch with one under each wing, or would you ever only launch one at a time? Okay, so this guy is the uh, is the Go uh, FET. So that one stays captive uh, all the time. The uh, the actual vehicles that we're flying are from a center line uh, hard point. So there's only one. Yeah, exactly, right there. Um, so uh, there's only one at a time. Um, there are other carrier aircraft options besides uh, the Gulfstreams that we're currently working towards, um, and it's certainly possible uh, for different applications to launch multiple vehicles from a single flight. Actually, we don't have the images uh, ready on, uh, at least for the show, but if you go to the website, you can look at them. But as you look at the images, basically each launcher gets bigger and bigger, as does the, uh, carry, cap, the carrying airplane itself. Uh, mm -hmm. is there, I assume that's just you know, size of payload changing depending upon what you need. It will increase the size of the air, aircraft? Yeah, exactly. So with an air launch system, um, you have uh, an additional gross weight limit. So ground launch rockets have a gross weight limit that's based on uh, the thrust of the engines. So we have that as well, but we also have the carriage capacity of the aircraft to deal with. So um, as you uh, want to grow the size of your rocket and grow the size of your payload to orbit, um, you need both more thrust and uh, the ability to carry more weight on an aircraft. I'm going to combine two questions from one person in the chat room from Trebles, which is, uh, which customers have shown the biggest interest? Is it government, military, education? And have you had uh, any interest from other countries as well? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think uh, all of those. So I think the, the primary interest from, uh, for the Go-1 uh, has come from uh, the Air Force um, and NASA here in the States. Um, we've had some interest uh, from Japan and also some commercial interest in that vehicle uh, from a couple of different companies who are uh, looking at other hypersonic systems that they're developing. Um, for uh, the orbital systems, we've had interest from all over the world. Um, we have 10 letters, 10 letters of intent signed for Go2, uh, which is an orbital, the orbital system that we mentioned. That's, uh, I think half of those are, uh, are domestic and half of those are international. So we're seeing uh, a good deal of support from all over the world. Uh, Peter asks, looking into the future, are you going to have CubeSat to the moon capability, or are you kind of focusing really on low Earth orbit? Uh, it depends on what the customer wants to do. Um, if, uh, if we've got the Delta V to take their, uh, their particular payload mass uh, on a particular trajectory, we'd be happy to do it for them, whether it's uh, to the moon, to an asteroid, um, or anywhere else in the solar system, um, so assuming we have the, uh, the performance to hit the, the trajectories that they need. Uh, Destructor 1701 has an interesting question and a topic that comes up more often than we like here in the U.S., which is, uh, have you encountered any issues with ITAR, the International Trade and Arms Regulations? Um, do you anticipate any showstoppers, showstoppers from a regulation standpoint? No. Uh, I mean, we, we deal with ITAR on a regular basis, um, just managing inf from an information management standpoint. Um, but as far as um, it being a hindrance to us, um, I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think we've had to deal with it in, in that regard. Um, all of our suppliers are domestic here in the U.S. Um, now, when it comes to operating an air launch system outside of the United States, um, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But, um, yeah, for the most part so far, everything's been fine. So now the big questions, uh, which boils down to money. Uh, uh, Tewicket asks, you have big plans, do you also have the funding to support them? That's a big thing in new space, is we all have a lot of really big ideas, but finding them, securing the money to actually execute on them is actually much harder than sometimes the idea itself. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, for us, it's important to have uh, a big vision. Uh, that's why we got into this business, and that's why most people do, I think. Um, 
but uh, we're also very realistic in terms of our, uh, you know, the goals that we set in the near term. Um, so the the steps that we've put forward on Go One are all funded, um, and uh, you know, like I said, the FET uh, is is operational and uh, can fly whenever we need it to. Um, so that's why uh, you know I'm not too uh, kind of uh, grandiose about um, the particular things we have coming in the future because I mean there there are a number of years down the road, um, and uh, the funding isn't there to back them up yet, but. Uh, we're very pleased with where we're going on Go One uh, right now. We have a number of milestones to hit in the next year. Um, we're ready to do it, and uh, yeah, now we just have to execute. So s- similar on the financials, um, uh, Damon asks, "How much does it cost?" And now that was kind of an open-ended question, so I'm going to say, <laughs> if we wanted to fly a payload tomorrow, sure. how much would it cost for different size payloads? Well, tomorrow and then sure, maybe so- a year. <laughs> so the the Go FET uh, tends to cost about 20k a flight. Um, so pretty low cost. Um, now that's again flying around in a captive carry pod underneath a Learjet. Um, but for uh, the kinds of things that we need to do, it works pretty well for us. Um, the Go One, uh, the cost point there uh, is about two million dollars per flight, um, which is about half of uh, kind of the current uh, next best system uh, that's available available for accessing uh, these kinds of flight conditions that the Go One is capable of. So you're looking kind of at that small, there's a huge, we've talked a lot about this a lot, huge explosion in the small sat launcher market. Is that really where you're going to mm-hmm. be focusing? You talked a little bit about uh, cargo and possibly a crew in the future, but right now is that is that it? Is it the small sat uh, market that you're really trying to target? So for us with Go One, it's it's hypersonic flight test. Um, you know, CubeSat is, uh, so I think, something that's, that's still, still growing um, and will come next for us once we get the Go One flying. Um, you know, for us, Go One is a is a pretty interesting business case on its own, but it also serves as a risk reduction platform for basically demonstrating the technologies that we need for larger air launch systems capable of getting to orbit, uh, whether it be cryogenic propellant management, um, overall operations, um, propulsion development, all those things we're able to work out with Go One um, and pave the way for uh, the next step. Uh, Interstellar asks where your launch site is, although, uh, you know, you're an air launch system, so your launch site's anywhere you have a runway, right? Potentially, potentially. So we do uh, we do like to launch from places that have FAA launch licenses, or, uh, excuse me, spaceport licenses. So uh, our baseline uh, base of operations will be Cecil Field, uh, or Cecil Spaceport, down in Jacksonville, Florida. They've had their uh, FAA launch, or, excuse me, again, uh, spaceport license for a number of years now. Um, so we actually flew uh, one of the Go FET flights out of uh, Cecil, uh, the first one. So it gave them a chance to essentially exercise some of their uh, launch procedures uh, on the ground and, and in the air. So scheduling airspace, um, running out all the uh, the safety equipment and so forth. So uh, it was a good opportunity to test uh, things that they've done on paper but never really done in real life. I bet Spaceport America is willing to give you a really good deal right now if you wanted to as well. <laughs> <laughs> all right, just a couple it's, more uh, here, a couple more questions before we uh, head back into break. Uh, one of it is uh, Heldas asks, what kind of customer base uh, did you identify when you're first building up the business plan versus what does the customer base actually look like now that you're actually starting to, mm-hmm. you, I know you're only doing captive carry stuff, but you know, as you're getting closer yep. to uh, go one. Sure. So uh, the customer base originally, um, I think you saw the first growth in small sats and cube sats for the most part coming out of uh, academia and government. Um, and uh, I think maybe three or four years ago, we really started to see a massive switch uh, to commercial customers, um, whether it be uh, Earth observation satellites, which I think have been uh, the real uh, kind of first uh, treaders uh, in terms of commercially viable small sat constellations, um, whether it's planet. Uh, or other companies doing uh, different types of Earth observation, not just remote sensing. Um, and then uh, I think you're going to see now going forward, uh, we've already started to see this a little bit as well, uh, is a transition, not so much a transition, but a growth toward uh, other segments of the small sat market, mainly for communications. So I think you're starting to see a lot more uh, IoT applications and uh, uh, in-space communications um, being, uh, being developed for uh, small sat uh, constellations and, and CubeSats in some cases. And then, of course, you have uh, the big SpaceX and OneWeb uh, Internet uh, constellations that are in development. So um, I think a lot of that has, has continued to drive uh, demand for uh, launch services across the spectrum of payload ranges from 5 kilograms up to you know, 150 or 200 or so. As you mentioned, you're designing Go One, and they're asking, uh, as you're designing that, are you designing the engines yourself? And if so, what fuels will we be using? Uh, that was from Lance. Sure, that's a great question. So the fuels are kerosene and liquid oxygen. Um, So 
uh, pretty standard uh, booster type fuels. Um, our engine is uh, being developed right now uh, at a small company in Denver called Ursa Major Technologies. A um, few, uh, few folks from Blue Origin uh, started that company a couple years ago, uh, and they're developing uh, the first ox-rich stage combustion engine uh, in quite some time. Uh, it's called Hadley. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the engine for Go-1. It's about 5,000 pounds thrust. So it sounds like Go-1 is pretty far along in the, in the, in the chain at this point. Um, from there, we saw, you know, we saw kind of go one, but then we also saw that space plane concept, the, uh, the go next. Uh, again, that was just conceptual mm -hmm. drawing uh, of what it may look like. What are the steps to get from go one to something like that space plane? Sure. So the first thing is learning to fly in the kinds of environments that are necessary to operate um, those types of high-speed point-to-point systems. And that means high Mach number, high dynamic pressure, so high Mach number in the atmosphere. Um, and demonstrating... Um, Scramjet propulsion um, or dual mode propulsion, whether it's ramjet, scramjet, um, and uh, also getting to those to the uh, to the Mach numbers where you can start operating those systems. Uh, there's obviously turbines and and rockets uh, as different ways to get there. So um, being able to demonstrate um, a fully integrated system that's capable of uh, you know going from New York to London in uh, minutes instead of hours. Um, that's that's really the next step for us after Go One is doing a small demo, I think, um, that uh, encompasses the demonstration of technologies that's necessary to build uh, the commercially viable um, systems like that. It also looks awesome. The, the mock-up, it just, it looks really <laughs> cool. It looks like the future on the screen, right? That was the future we were promised in oh, the yeah. 60s and 70s. It's, it, it's really awesome looking. Uh, so, yeah, our, uh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. I was going to say our, our background, um, you know, from SpaceWorks. SpaceWorks uh, does a lot of conceptual design, and we've been working hypersonic systems uh, for uh, you know ten or fifteen years. Um, and it's it's you know being able to actually be a part of building uh, vehicles and flying them um, that are uh, actually going to make these types of future vehicles that we we've, we've had on our walls for years uh, a reality is is really really exciting. Uh, where can people go for more information on what you guys are doing? Uh, sure. So you can check out our website at generationorbit.com. Um, our Twitter feed is uh, usually a little bit more uh, up to date than our website. Um, so you can find us at Generation Orbit. Um, and if you, uh, if you ever have any questions or want to ask questions about what we do or come see us in Atlanta, uh, just feel free to send an email to info at generationorbit.com. That's pretty awesome stuff. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to come on the show. Uh, it's going to be fun to kind of watch the progress of Go On and then up to Go Next and uh, see how things uh, are going for you. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Ben. It's been a pleasure.